to introduce our, our speaker today. Uh, very excited uh, as part of our colloquium team to present Dr. Beth Thiebring. There's a lot we can say about her. I'm just going to keep it really short. Um, she's a senior lecturer at Goldsmiths University of London. That's equivalent to a social professor for us North Americans. And uh, she is a computer scientist. She's a musician. She's an artist. She's a designer. Um, and uh, she is one of the true pioneers uh, of the intersection of machine learning, human computer interaction, and music. And so I think those are, I'll, I'll just seed your mind with those, and I think I'll, we'll let Rebecca Great. take it back from there. Thanks, good. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's Great to be here. Great to see all of you. Um, I'm going to start out by assuming that um, most of you know that machine learning is apparently really important and happening everywhere, and that some of you may not know any more than that. Um, so we're going to start from the basics, and I want to give you hopefully a really accessible and also really useful <laughs> introduction to what machine learning is with um, cats and kittens, or kittens and puppies. So uh, machine learning is really just a set of tools, algorithmic tools, for finding patterns in data. And if you take a conventional machine learning course, often you're going to focus on application areas that either save lives or make money. So like nothing having to do with music at all. Um, so we're going to assume that like I own a business, maybe, and these are my customers. And I might have demographic information about these customers. And I could use machine learning to find that maybe I have a few different clusters of customers that are similar. And of course, I could use this to decide to um, send them different types of advertising emails, perhaps. Um, machine learning algorithms also can use these patterns to make predictions. So say I am selling um, music, and I see that some customers have bought music by one particular artist, and other customers have bought music by another artist. If I have a new customer, who of course I, I know all about them because I've been tracking them across the internet for years, I could say, well, that person clearly, I'm going to advertise this artist to them. Um, third, we can use machine learning to take advantage of these patterns and learn how to generate new data that's similar in some way. And of course, a lot of the excitement about creative machine learning in the last few years focuses on this type of machine learning. Um, this isn't so interesting in terms of generating new customers, um, like fictitious customers, but it is more fun if we think about like pictures of cats. So these are now just pictures of cats, and if I train a machine learning algorithm on lots and lots of pictures of cats, if I use the right kind of algorithm, I can generate new photos of cats that are more or less believable um, forever. Um, so that's fun. And of course, we can do this with music. And there's projects both focused on music at Google Magenta. There's WaveNet. There's you know, new papers out all the time in this space saying, well, can we generate new musical audio or speech audio? And um, WaveNet um, is old now in machine learning years. This is like a year old in human years. Um, <laughs> this, this algorithm is, is more or less doing the same kind of thing that you saw with the cat photos. It looked at a large, in this case, a large database of piano music, classical piano music. And we can get it to generate sound. And it sounds like this. Right? And that's, that's pretty cool. right? This isn't MIDI. This is actually just learning really from the audio samples what a piano sounds like. Um, and it's captured the timbre, it's captured the temporal dynamics, and it's got some idea of melodic and even dynamic structure happening. Um, and of course, it's not just audio that might be interesting in music. We can do these um, you know, generation of, say, images to generate new album art. So these are all album covers generated with neural networks. And one of my favorite people on the internet right now, who you should follow on Twitter if you're not, is named Janelle Shane. And she does all sorts of really fun um, text generation. And a lot of them are band names. Um, so this is metal band name generation. And some of them are really fun. right? It's clearly learn something about what it means to be a metal band. We've got Dragon Red of Blood, Death House, Voltrum, bunch of stuff. And then there's some questionable choices here. Um, Chaos Warge La Plague is uh, <laughs> down here. And I think this is kind of emblematic of where deep learning generation systems are at the moment, right? Pretty good, some questionable judgment, but um, you know, sometimes that's funny, we're OK. And they're getting better 
all the time. So um, clearly, this is the future of creativity, right? These systems are getting better. Eventually, in the next two years, probably, they're going to do everything that we do really well, and we will not have to do anything else, right? Um, so we just get basically a button. We say, I want to compose a piece of music, and we hit the button, and we're done. So the end, right? <laughs> right? You're laughing. You're laughing, right? This is, there's, there's something kind of funny here. Um, first, right, there's a bunch of problems. First, I, I put some asterisks here on the button. Um, the first one is because really these types of techniques work best if you have tons of computing power, ideally lots of expensive GPUs, um, lots of data, which in itself limits the type of problems that you can work with. Um, and if you have a PhD and lots of programming and math exper experience, then you know, you're in pretty good shape. Um, so it kind of limits the set of people and the set of problems that we can approach. Um, and for the things that I just showed you, if you don't like what it outputs, you're kind of stuck. Like tweaking the algorithm may or may not help you. Um, you could press the button again and get something slightly different, but it's kind of hard to do anything more with it. And so these types of systems that I just showed kind of have this really weird interaction model, which reminds me a bit, you know, somebody saying, well, hey, you're a creative person. Obviously, you're going to want me to like, write that symphony for you. Um, and all of us are like, well, it's, you know, that's, not, that's not the point. Um, however, there are a lot of really exciting opportunities to use machine learning in music, in composition, in instrument design, in all sorts of other creative pursuits, um, and, and to do really fun things with it. Um, so today, in this, the rest of this talk, I want to get all of you thinking a little bit more broadly about what we can do with machine learning, why it might be fun, why it might be actually you know, exciting despite all of the, the cheap shots that I've just taken. Um, so I've, I've been doing research in this area since about 2008. Um, I'm really interested in this top question. How can machine learning support and extend people's musical practices? Not how can it replace people or mimic people, although there are good reasons for trying to, to do that. But I'm interested in how to support people like you in this room, people who are professional composers or creative students, um, all sorts of other folks. And when I say, you know, how can we do this, we can break that question down using the definition of machine learning that I started with at the beginning. So if we think about machine learning as a tool to find patterns, make predictions, generate new data, I'm interested in how these types of things can be creatively useful, why they're creatively useful. And I'm also interested in this last question, because I don't find it that interesting if it remains just a bunch of people with really strong programming and math experience and um, engineering chops making these systems. I, mean, I think that's great, and there are lots of creative people with those credentials. But if we can make tools that lots of musicians and students and even kids can use, then that suddenly becomes much more fun. And we're going to have people doing really weird stuff that uh, you know, I wouldn't have thought of, you probably wouldn't have thought of. Um, so one key to recognizing the scope of opportunities for applying machine learning um, is to really recognize that data that we can use to find patterns, make predictions, generate, is, is everywhere. Um, a lot of this, you know, if you are paying attention to the music information retrieval community, obviously there's lots of cool music data about, you know, large audio repositories. If you were Spotify, you'd have so much music that you could play around with. Um, if you're not Spotify, you probably have lots of samples on your computer. You have maybe even audio that you've generated. If you're a composer, it's sitting around and you could use that as a source of data. Um, we could have audio or for that part, you know, video or other sensor data from people performing in real time. We could get biosignal data. Um, and of course, interaction data uh, from the things that you do as you interact with software in your own creative work or your academic work. And of course, there's all sorts of other sources of data that aren't inherently musical, but data that people care about, right? The weather, social media. People have been turning these sources of data into sound and music for decades in some cases. And we can use a machine learning to interact with those data in different ways. Um, so when I started working on this area a little bit more than 10 years ago, um, I was coming from a music information retrieval master's program. And I was, had been thinking about you know, how, do you take, how do you make predictions about, say, what kind of music people might like based on their, 
past um, interests. And I was doing things like genre classification or artist classification, where you look at audio and try to say something that's semantically relevant and correct about it. And then I got really interested in how we could use these same predictive models and put them on stage in performance and ask, you know, what, what could we do with that? Um, and obviously, you know, one set of applications would be things like maybe real-time music information retrieval, where we have audio that's being analyzed, and maybe we're labeling that audio. We're making decisions about what audio the computer should make or what visuals the computer should make. And of course, there's you know, lots of people doing work in this area and lots of space for new work. Um, another application domain that I got interested in was to say, well, maybe we can take data in that's really data about how people are moving or acting, and the output is information about how the computer should generate sound. And one way of looking at this is, well, this is useful for building new musical instruments. And again, it's the same predictive machine learning architecture that you would use to make product recommendations, except here we're predicting what sound the computer thinks you want it to make when you do a particular thing. Um, so with that, I want to show you a demo of the software that I started building, uh, again, about 10 years ago now. I'm going to show you the most recent version of it. It's changed a lot over the last decade, as I've used it um, with lots of different musicians and artists and game designers. Um, but the core has always been this, the idea that um, I wanted to build something that allowed anybody, professional musicians, kids, whoever, to use machine learning in real-time contexts. And the idea is that we're going to use this predictive architecture, supervised learning, um, and we're going to get some data in from the world. Could be from some sensors, could be something else. We're going to send that data via OSC to make it really general. And we're going to take the data from the machine learning and send it out via OSC, where you can use it to make sound in Chuck or Max, or you could control a robot, or you could make you know, control processing, or whatever you want. Um, and of course, the really fun part is that Wekinator, the software that I built, isn't just for doing this. It's also a tool for building these models, even if you're not a programmer, even if you don't know much about machine learning. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple demos and show you how that all works. So first demo I'm going to do is going to be some sound. We're going to control a, a little drum machine. And most of you will have heard this before. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to use the world's worst computer vision system to control this drum machine. Um, so this is just going to take my webcam and chop it into a 10 by 10 grid and send that as, as data to Wekinator. So you can kind of see it's, it's reacting to me. Um, I consider myself to be a really good programmer, and I would not want the job of analyzing this data to say something useful about what's happening in front of the camera. But lots of, lots of problems that we have to deal with look kind of like this, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick Wackinator in between the webcam and the drum machine. And I'm going to tell it to listen for these 100 values and to build a classifier. So we're going to start from scratch. Obviously, there's no ground truth. Rebecca's crappy webcam to chuck ground truth data set out there on the internet. Um, we're going to make it from scratch. So I'm going to tell it to make this sound when I'm sitting here. And I've just captured 14 examples, kind of snapshots of that sound paired with me here. And I'm going to choose a different sound and say, when I'm leaning over, I want it to make that sound. So let's see if it works. I'm going to train it, build a machine learning model, and now run it, right? <laughs> and it works pretty well, but it's making some mistakes. Right, so it's making some mistakes around there. So I'm going to tell it, no, actually, this should still be the first sound. So I'm adding new training examples, and I'm rebuilding. All right, it's pretty good. We're, we've actually got a more complicated situation than usual because it's getting a feedback loop of itself on the screen. Um, but that's, you know, that's fine. And again, I can try to say, well, this is also, you know, oops, this should also be the first sound. And I can keep refining it and making it a little bit better. And we appear to be a little bit more robust, making some mistakes somewhere. So I'm just going to keep giving it some more examples. And it should, yeah, it's pretty happy there. Still happy there. And once I'm happy with this, I could say, right, I want to make it more complicated now. 
here's my hand. And there we go, right? So that's a really quick and easy way to work with crappy sensor data and build something useful. Um, the second demo I want to do for you is a little bit different and actually reflects the more typical use of Weconator by musicians. And instead of just building a classifier to switch between different samples or um, chuck loops, I'm going to control a max patch. I'm going to use my favorite physical modeling synthesis algorithm, the blowtar. And we're going to use one of these lovely uh, game track tethers to build a blowtar instrument. And so here, I'm going to load Weconator and tell it I want six values from our game track. And I've got nine parameters of blowtar that I want to control. And so let's start out by finding a sound that we like on blowtar. So, oh no, blowtar, where are you? We might, uh, where is my? Is there audio on? Yeah. Built in output. All right, let's see. What if? I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit that and restart it. Maybe it'll work. Yeah. Chuck is dead. Chuck is not the problem this time. I I don't I don't mean that in a snarky way. I love Chuck. I love Chuck. All right, there we go. It's restarting. All right, so maybe I like this sound and I want this sound to happen when I put the string there, and maybe. I like that sound a lot. I want that sound over there. So now I'm going to run some machine learning models that give me continuous control. We're using regression here. So I've got kind of that first, that second sound here. The first sound is kind of hard to find. So I might say, well, I really do want that sound. And I'll give it more examples of that sound that I want. And so I've, I've got that a little bit easier to access, but I've got some cool stuff happening around it. And this is actually pretty fun. I'm getting sounds that I didn't put in it originally, and I can explore a bit. Like, I really like that one. That's cool. And I could even add this sound to be more prominent by adding more training examples. And then I've got that in there. And you know, I can keep doing this for a long time, right? I could do this for the whole talk, probably, and it would be fun. Um, but that's, that's a little glimpse of what most composers who are using Weconator do. Usually, they're, they're using it to control much more complicated things than just you know, a play sound one, two, three, or four. All right, so let's go back to the slides. Um, I've had. Um, probably, definitely over 10,000 people download Weconator, just the latest release, and it's probably 15,000 at this point. And lots of people are using it. If you go online, search for Weconator on YouTube or Vimeo, you'll see some really queer, weird, crazy stuff. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of my favorites so that you know it's not just about blowtar. Um, this is a piece by Anne Hagee using the same controller, playing um, some really beautiful music. Um, we Start there.
I like this example because when she was beginning to make this piece, she had a really clear idea of how she wanted people to move. The quality of movement and the type of movement were really important to her. And likewise, the quality of the sound and the way that the sound changed. She had a really clear idea in mind. And she was able to build this pretty easily by giving examples rather than saying, oh, I need to reverse engineer that and figure out how to write the code that allows that to happen. Um, Another one of my favorite early pieces with Wekinator is a, a piece by Michelle Nagai, who was walking down the road one day and found a piece of tree bark and was like, well, I need to make this tree bark into a musical instrument, obviously. Um, she put something like 25 light sensors in the bark, and she plays it by casting shadows over the bark with her hands. And it's, it's really lovely. And I like this because it's visually striking. It's amazing music. You should go on Vimeo and, and see some videos. But it's also the kind of thing where you'd be, you'd be sitting there very unhappy for a long time trying to make this instrument if you were doing Max or Chuck or something else, because that's a lot of input. It's complicated input. Um, and again, she was able to make something pretty easily. Um, the last example I want to show you is um, Lucicia Tsunami, who I think came and gave a talk here maybe recently, maybe? Oh. OK, getting no. Maybe, maybe that was another school, which we won't mention. Um, uh, this instrument is something she's been working on for about six years. She's using audio pickups to sense the motion of springs that she's plucking. Um, and you're not hearing the sound of the springs. She's just using these as sensors. Um, but she's using some, um, basically, energy in different frequency bands of each spring as inputs to Wekinator, and then using that to control um, some max patches. So I, it's a fun instrument if I can get it to play. Come on. All right, we'll play it here. Come on. So you get the idea. This is from her Nime keynote a couple years ago, and you can watch the whole thing um, on YouTube. And I just I like the the physicality of this instrument. I like that you know she's using the physics of the springs as you know something that's going to affect the way that it gets played. But you get this really neat sound, and it sounds different when she plays different pieces. You wouldn't recognize the sound if you were just you know hearing it and not seeing it. Um, so a bunch of other people have used Wekinator for really cool stuff, um, not just in music, but for puppetry, for art projects, for really whimsical um, interactions without a real purpose, making products. This guy has a startup in London called Voclia, where you can sing or beatbox into a microphone and um, turn that into an instrument. So there's a bunch of stuff. And again, I could probably give a whole talk just about these. But I want to talk about this as a researcher. and. Um, one of the things that I've done since I made the first version of Wekinator um, was really try to ask, you know, why is this useful? Um, I made the first version really in a participatory process which, with a bunch of composers at Princeton when I was doing my PhD. And at that point in time, it was really hard to use. It was really buggy. And there are a few people who were using it anyway. And I you know, wanted to know, well, how do I make this better and more useful? But why would you choose to do this instead of something else? And that's still a question that I always ask people when they're using it for serious projects. Like, there are any number of other ways you could build something. Why use machine learning? Why use Wekinator? Um, and of course, how can I make that? How can I make Wekinator more useful and more usable? But how, do, how does that feed into my other research? Um, how do we learn something about how to make useful tools for creative people? Um, so this question of why, why machine learning instead of, say, building all these things just in Max or Chuck or something else. And there's a machine learning answer to it, which is that, well, machine learning is a great way to handle noisy high-dimensional sensors. 
And that's true. And sometimes this is a great reason for people who use my software, but sometimes they're actually not using noisy high dimensional sensors. Like, you know, this is six dimensions and it's pretty not noisy. Um, so it turns out there's actually some more interesting answers here. And I'm going to spend most of the rest of my talk discussing these um, because despite machine learning and especially the algorithms that I'm using in Wekinator, these were not meant to support creative work. They weren't meant to support design, but there's some properties of machine learning algorithms that end up being really surprisingly well matched to people doing different types of creative work. Um, in music in particular, I'm going to start here. Um, one of the really practical benefits is that using supervised learning, the way that I showed you in the demo, makes it really easy to make many-to-many -many mappings. So if you're familiar with Marcella Wanderley and Andy Hunt's really you know, seminal work on, in the NIME space, either they looked at many-to-many -many mappings in which you have lots of sensors controlling lots of things, and these are all you know, interconnected. It's not just that you have a theremin-like interface where you've got volume controlled over here and you've got you know, pitch controlled over here. You've got something more complicated. Um, and they showed that actually many-to-many -many mappings can be easier to learn. They can feel more musically expressive. They can, you know, they've got lots of benefits and arguably some commonalities with the acoustic instruments that we really love. Um, and this is really hard. These types of functions, if you're writing them in code, are hard to write. And they're even worse when you write it and it works, but it doesn't do the thing that you want. And you have to figure out how the heck you're going to change it to make it more musical. Um, and machine learning makes that pretty easy. Um, but it's not just about making things easier and faster. So when I started working with composers who were experimenting with the early versions of my tools, I noticed that it wasn't just that they said, oh, yay, I don't have to spend all day writing my mapping now. I can go do something else. They actually spent the same amount of time or even more time building instruments, but found that um, they were using that time in a more satisfying way. And so if you think about the, the blowtar demo that I showed you, I was kind of started out with a basic idea of what I wanted to build. And 20 seconds later, I had that. And then I played with it, and I learned about it. And that informed my ideas about what I liked about it, what I might want to change. And I iteratively refined it. Right? And because it's also really easy to say, well, I have an idea, and I don't know if it's a good one or not, but I'd like to maybe explore that, try it out, and then you know, if it's not, it's, if it's not good, I've only wasted 30 seconds and not a whole day of programming. The overhead to, to experimentation is also lower. And we can understand these as really powerful properties of building things with data rather than building things with code. Um, yeah. And really, what we're doing is allowing people to rapidly prototype ideas and to explore alternative ideas. And if you look at design research, about you know, what makes for good design processes in any field, these are pretty key. Um, and again, as you saw in the demo, the way that Wekinator is structured supports this pretty nicely. That wasn't always the case. And I learned a lot from the composers I was working with because there's actually a, a but here, which is that this isn't how machine learning is supposed to work. Um, and I was coming at this from someone who had you know, taken all the right computer science machine learning courses, and it wasn't obvious to me that these things were important or that were, they were well supported by machine learning. So in conventional machine learning contexts, um, the goal of machine learning is usually something more or less like this. You want to take the data that you have, build an accurate model, and then use that model, for instance, to make accurate predictions on new unseen data. Right? That's, that's machine learning 101. And if you build that model and it doesn't make accurate predictions, you have a few things that you know you should do. You might want to change your algorithm. You might want to change the features, your data representation. If there's a way for you to get more data, that's often um, useful. But that's the world that you're working in. In the world of, say, building a new musical instrument, we've got some really important differences. So sometimes, yes, we may want to build an accurate system. right? If I um, am building a cello bow gesture recognizer, I want it to be accurate. I don't want it to just make up stuff because it's fun. right? I want it to make accurate predictions. Um, but my goal is to have something that's musically useful. right? And so I have some leeway, perhaps, in how many gestures I might want to recognize. Sometimes people don't care about accuracy in that kind of way at all. They want something that's an expressive musical controller. Or you want a musical instrument that you can play and move in a way where you don't look stupid. right? That's also kind of important. 
And if you build a model, it doesn't give you those things. Often the best way to fix it is to change the training data. Right? So when the initial example I gave you, where I was doing moving and having the drum machine change, um, I could give it examples to correct its mistakes and say, no, I actually want this thing to happen here. And I can do that because I'm sort of an expert in what I want my drum machine to do, which is not always the case in conventional applications. Um, I also may want to explore a different idea and say, well, what happens if my data looks like this? What happens if the thing I'm building had this behavior instead? And so this sort of human in the loop, changing, mangling the data, this is often described as interactive machine learning in HCI. There are lots of non-creative applications of this, um, but this, you know, this idea here of that, you know what, our, our human ideas about what we're building might actually change as well, I think was Pretty, pretty powerful, and it's a key to making this useful. Um, and so in my, my HCI group talk on Friday, I'm going to say a little bit more about this, but once you really start thinking about how people are using machine learning here, you realize that the set of algorithms that might be really good to use is a bit different. The user interfaces that you give people to do this are actually quite different. And so again, I, I mentioned the Wecknader interface I showed you looks totally different from how it did at the beginning because I've been working with people to try to figure out, first of all, to learn that these things were important and then to make them usable. Um, I'm going to mention a couple of side projects um, throughout this talk um, where we've explored different ideas that com come up um, in you know, casual often short-term ways with students. So one, one of the things I want to mention is a project with a student who um, we said, hey, what, what would it look like to build an interface that expects people to change their mind about what they want the system to learn, rather than assuming that you start out with one idea and just stick with it? What, can we help people explore the consequences of different formulations of the learning problem? And by the way, let's do that in an interface that allows you to beatbox and control sound, because that's really fun. Um, so we have a paper about that. Um, more recently, I have just finished up a collaborative project with folks at IRCAM and UPF in Barcelona, where we're working with a bunch of different companies and trying to make machine learning tools for their developers. So um, Wekinator is fun. It's useful for people who aren't programmers. But um, why not give programmers the same ability to use this interactive approach to machine learning, making it really easy for them to do the things that you can do in Wekinator, changing the data set, trying out things, rolling back, and so on. And furthermore, doing all of this without knowing very much about machine learning, because that actually describes a lot of professional developers at this moment. Um, so that's been pretty fun. You can download the tools that we made at rapidmixapi.com. Um, I've had a, a PhD student who's going to finish next year sometime really focusing as well on this question of how do we engage developers in these participatory processes, similar to the ones that I've do, been doing in the design of Wekinator. How do we make sure that we can make a usable machine learning API? Turns out it's a tough question, um, but that's been a fun project. All right, so the third finding that I really surprised me, but in retrospect makes sense, is that data and machine learning can be really powerful tools for creative people because they're actually so much better than math or code when it comes to describing things about the body or describing sort of tacit knowledge or practices. Um, turns out we often want computers to understand something about how we're moving or how we're feeling or what we're doing. And the way that we would describe that to another person is by demonstrating, right? Um, it's really awkward to step back and say, well, I want to move like this and then have to describe that as a mathematical equation or a set of conditions that you might test on some sensor data. Much more natural to demonstrate it. Um, and so one of the most common answers I got early on, asking people, why are you using this piece of code with machine learning? It's totally weird. They would say, well, it allows me to think like a composer. right? I'm thinking about movement. I'm thinking about sound. I'm not thinking about math unless I really want to, which is, which is great. Um, I, uh, this idea of how data can provide a foundation for computer systems that deeply understand aspects of embodied practice. This got picked up by a PhD student of mine who just finished last year named Reed Oda. And he started thinking about the data that people generate as they're playing acoustic instruments and 
recognize that if we're looking at how somebody moves either a real drumstick or a fake drumstick, um, we can pretty accurately predict when they're going to hit that, you know, that surface or that pretend drum head. And if we can accurately predict this, that means that we can send this information to, say, a remote collaborator over the internet before that hit happens. And they can synthesize the sound on their computer in Tokyo the same time you hear the real sound at your location in New York. And we can do that without latency, which is pretty cool. Um, I have a, another student, Katie Wolf, who just finished, who teamed up with Reed to also say, well, you know what? We could also do this in local performance, right? Why not have um, DMIs, right? Silent instruments that performers play, and everybody in the audience can hear the sound um, through their smartphone. Um, and so we see, you know, we do the, the sound synthesis on the phone, and we get absolute synchronization between the performer and the sound. But now that this is synthesized on the phone, we can give individual audience members control over how that mapping is done. And we can give them a role in the performance as well, which is fun. Um, fourth point I want to make, which is also really important, is that designing with data can be great because it allows more people to become creators. So as you saw in the demo, um, I didn't have to program anything to use Wekinator as long as that input and output thing exist. Um, I've done a lot of workshops with high school kids. These are 15-year-olds who I, I taught them how to build computer music instruments. And then in the afternoon after this workshop, they taught the eight-year-old students in the classroom next door. And so I like that because I can teach people about music, about interaction design, without requiring them to have a lot of code um, skills already. Um, a lot of the deep learning generative tools out there are also getting a lot of attention because they are accessible and they give different ways for people who aren't professional creators to have sort of an in to making stuff that looks or sounds really cool. Um, these are a couple of my favorites here. This is Edges to Cats which allows you to make sort of a sketch of an edge and it fills it in with the thing that, you know, is like the most like a real cat that it can make from your sketch. Um, and then this is Neural Doodle. Yeah, this, you should look at this on your own because this projector really isn't doing it justice. There's some freaky stuff here. Um, <laughs> Neural Doodle basically gives you Microsoft Paint and turns it into a great work of art. Um, and, you know, I. I put these here, they, they do, I think, increase accessibility to small c creative um, interaction, but they do it by giving people training wheels, right? They assume that what you want to do is adhere to some standard, and you can have that standard because these are trained on pretty large data sets where they're trained on things that people think of as like the right way to do art um, and so on, which is okay, you know, it's, it's cool, but it's also um, inflexible in some ways. So in a lot of my work, I'm interested in how we can put end users, non-experts, non-computer scientists in the loop of creating machine learning systems where they're maybe choosing the data that gets trained on or they're giving their own data. Um, they're maybe managing the machine learning process. And because of that, able to use these to do much more personalized um, activities or to appropriate tools in much more flexible ways. Um, so for the last few years, I've been doing a lot of work with people with different kinds of disabilities. Um, started out working with some adults with various uh, physical mobility impairments, and more recently have been working with music therapists, who um, some of them are quite adventurous, and they saw Wacken in, and they're, and they're like, we want that. We want to build instruments for the kids that we work with, many of whom have really severe mobility uh, restrictions. And so we ended up building them a tool, which you can download um, at that URL. It's a standalone tool that anybody can use with cheap off-the-shelf sensors, including lots of webcam um, and audio input. And you can play your own sound files. You can loop them. You can also do FM synthesis, which kids really like. And I can talk more about that if you're interested. Um, and this has been fun, because what we thought was going to happen here was that the therapists and teachers were going to work with kids and build them bespoke instruments, right? Because a lot of these are kids who can't play pianos or violins or other things that they might learn in a music classroom. And originally, the therapists were like, yeah, we want to build things that allow these kids to participate in music making. And they did that, but they ended up doing a lot of other things as well. And that the therapists, once they learned how to use this, started making curricula 
around the fact that they now had the ability to instantaneously change something that a kid was doing to put any, you know, lots of different kinds of sensors together with lots of different kinds of sounds. Um, and so they were using this, and they are still using this, to do things like switch um, in a lesson plan to say, well, right now I really want, I want to make an activity that allows this kid to have a sense of agency over the sound. So I'm going to use this particular configuration, and I'm going to embed it in this kind of activity. And then maybe five minutes later, they might switch to something else. So there's, there's a lot of use of this beyond just, well, I'm going to make an instrument for you to use um, that I'm finding really exciting. Um, I have another project, not in the music space, but taking a lot of these same ideas with some collaborators at Microsoft Research, um, exploring how we can use end user interactive machine learning to build better personalized systems for people who are blind and visually impaired. And so I can't talk a lot about this project yet, but the basic idea is we can get a lot of information with computer vision systems that talk about what's going on in a space, especially who's there, what they're doing, um, whether you know them, and so on. Um, and we really need personalization to know what kind of information people are interested in and how that varies based on context, for instance. Um, last example I want to talk about in this space of allowing more people to be creators and to customize systems for themselves. Um, this is some work by another one of my PhD students who recently graduated. And she was interested in um, how we might change our experience of social media. Right? So usually your, your Twitter feed is just a set of texts and either you're reading it or you're not. Um, and if you have alerts on for it, it's not very informative and it's really disruptive, right? It's kind of dinging or making some stupid sound, which doesn't actually tell you much. And so she was interested in saying, well, how can we take the fact that people can very easily show us examples of their social media feeds. They can also give us information about what in that feed is of interest to them. And they can give us examples of sounds or soundscapes that they really like. And from those examples, if we you know, formulate this as an optimization problem, we can give them a sonification mapping where they can stick their Twitter data into it and they can hear some kind of perhaps, probably more pleasing but also more informative sound like the sound of the ocean, um, where different, you know, different characteristics of the sound might tell you different things about what's happening um, on Twitter. So I, I'm doing all this work with an awareness that at the moment, right, most people's experience of machine learning and data is not empowering at all. Right? It's often very disempowering and upsetting, I think, as it should be in many cases. Um, but I've become really interested in this, this question of you know, what should we be doing, not just as computer musicians or even just as creative people, to look, re rethink this. right? Because in my work, I think it's pretty clear you don't need to be a machine learning expert to use machine learning effectively, and in, in fact, in quite sophisticated ways. right? If you have a good user interface, if you have good access to data, um, you can be you know, a music therapist who doesn't use the computer other than to check email and actually do some really interesting stuff. So why aren't more people exploring this design space? Um, and what, you know, what can we be doing that actually you know, changes, changes people's experience of being the subject of machine learning um, to being creators or at least feeling more empowered um, whether to make things or to be part of the conversation about how they want machine learning to be um, impacting them. All right, so the last, um, last thing I want to say about why machine learning is useful is that um, it is changing the types of creative roles that are available for people and the ways that people relate to technology in the creation process. Um, and of course, in this Edges to Cats demo and plenty other demos like this, one of the things that machine learning offers the user is a way to work at a higher level, right? To sketch out something about, well, I kind of like, I want the content that gets created to look a little bit like this, but I don't have the expertise, or maybe I don't have the time to fill in the details. So you're a sort of high level planner. Um, does anybody know Juke Deck? I should have put a Juke Deck slide in here. Juke Deck is a music startup based in London that um, it's kind of like the edges to cats for music. Um, you can say, well, I want um, a, an EDM track. I want it to be three minutes and 40 seconds long. I want the, you know, 
I want the climax of the track to happen this far in, and I want it to be in a pensive mood. And then it'll generate you a track, and if you like it, you pay them a licensing fee and you use it in your YouTube video. And it's, you know, it's not the most beautiful music ever, but it's probably better than no music. It's probably better than the music that that content creator would be able to make in the five minutes that they have to spare. Um, so check that out. Um, Mario Klingemann is one of my favorite visual artists using machine learning right now. Um, he is also, by the way, a very experienced programmer, a very technical person. So he's able to use deep learning tools in really lovely ways, making really you know, visually striking and creatively interesting art. Um, and he was interviewed by Wired uh, a few months ago and talked about his process. And he, I think, you know, he didn't talk so much about the process of coding and testing and you know, refining his algorithms. Um, talked about once he's built the algorithm to do the generation, he's really acting as a curator. Most of the, the things that his algorithm spits out are not very good, but he, he ended up building himself like a Tinder-like interface where he could choose very, very efficiently um, between the crap and the stuff that he actually liked and wanted to sell for, you know, some, you know, to galleries and stuff. Um, this is a quote by Letitia Tsunami, somebody, again, I showed her instrument earlier. Um, I've learned a lot from her. I've worked with her, again, for about six years now. Um, and she's really um, made me critical of this assumption that I think most computer scientists have, that when you do something with a computer, the ideal state is for it to do exactly what you want as efficiently as possible. Um, that's something that's not usually questioned. Um, but what she says, I'm going to read this, in a way, you don't want the instrument to perform like a well-trained animal circus. You kind of want it to be a little wild, and you want to adapt to it somehow, like riding a bull. I think the machine learning allowed more of this fun of exploring instead of going, I have to have a result right away. This thing is going to do that, and then leaving it at that. Um, and again, hopefully you saw in the, the game track blowtar demo that I showed you that I can start out making an instrument. It's, you know, it's not completely random. I can start with an idea and kind of sketch out the, the boundaries of the, the sonic and gestural interactions. Um, but it's going to do something that I didn't expect somewhere in the middle. Sometimes I like that, sometimes I don't. And that makes it interesting. It makes it interesting to play with. Um, and I think she's hitting on something really fundamental here. I think. Whether we're creating something with computers or with paint or with a piano, right? The, there are characteristics of those objects that inevitably shape what we do with them, right? And to to think that to think otherwise, we're we're deceiving ourselves. But I think, in especially in you know the programming space, there's this idea that well, when we make something. Obviously, we just start with a really good idea. And the better the interface that we have to the computer, the more clearly and efficiently we can express that idea. And then if it turns out well, it's just because we're a genius, right? And most people don't work like that, right? There's always this interplay between our initial creative ideas and the tools that we're using and the way that they might speak back to us or suggest different ways of use. And I think this, you know, this is something that's really special about machine learning and that you can, you can get that really easily. Um, and it can be foregrounded really easily with a lot of these generative algorithms and with a lot of the continuous control, like the, the blowtar demo I showed you. It's another quick side project I'll mention. I, I worked with um, an intern last year where we said, well, what would it look like if we made an instrument building system that really tried to do this well, that just, you know, no matter what you did, was going to give you something that surprised you. And so this was grab and play mapping, um, where you grab a sensor, you move it around, and then it makes you an instrument. Right? And that's it. And it's pretty fun, pretty quick. If you don't like it, you generate another one. You're acting a little bit, again, more as a curator. Um, and that's been fun to play with. And in fact, we uh, found that the music therapists that we've been working with really love it for a lot of the work that they're doing. And so we've put it into the tool for them. Um, at the NIPS conference, I gave a keynote at the, music, uh, the machine learning, creative machine learning workshop in December, and I, I showed them this slide, and I challenged everybody there to think about like, what might we do with machine learning that isn't mimicking things that people do, and it also isn't about giving people 
more precise control over things. Um, and I think we have lots of metaphors in artistic and musical practice, things that we use or people that are part of our processes. And we could think about how machine learning could play these roles. So how would it look like to um, have a machine learning system that acts as a, a paintbrush or a sketch pad or a violin or a telescope or another part of our body or a person that we work with closely, like an audience member or a student or a teacher. Um, and I think you know, for Wekinator, often sometimes it, it feels a bit like a sketch pad to me, where you're sketching out some things that you wanted to do. But I don't know. I think there's, there's a lot more to explore here. So I want to finish up by just saying a few words about some stuff I'm working on currently. Um, I've got a couple new grants um, at the moment, one focusing on the problem of feature engineering, which if you are a computer scientist, if you've done any machine learning stuff, you know that feature engineering is uh, kind of, well, having the right features, having the right representation of your data is key to being able to learn something. And I think a lot of people in computer science at the moment are pretending like feature engineering is solved because we've got deep learning. We can just learn good representations. And sometimes that's the case. And sometimes those representations learned from ImageNet or other types of deep learning systems are really fun to then stick into creative tools like Wekinator. But sometimes you can't do that. And a lot of the power and you know, things that I'm interested in um, are enabling people to build things from small data sets or totally weird data sets that don't exist out there in the world. And so when you're doing that, often feature engineering um, becomes important again. Um, I'm also, I've got a project kicking off next month with some folks you might know, including Nick Collins, Thor Magnuson. Um, and my part on the project is going to be looking at deep learning and saying, what can we do with the stuff that's currently out there and trying to bundle it up in ways that are really accessible to musicians, to composers, um, and uh, actually well matched to their needs. So not just giving them a big red button, but giving them different ways of interacting um, to try to make stuff that is really uniquely their own. Um, and I've got a bunch of other projects increasingly focused on machine learning education. Um, I've been running a MOOC on Cadenze for the last few years called Machine Learning for Artists and Musicians. And um, in that, and now in my class at Goldsmiths, I've been exploring you know, how, do we teach machine, how do we teach machine learning to creative people. Um, it's not just about dumbing it down and removing the math. That's absolutely not it. I think there's a lot to be said for giving people intuitions about how algorithms work. You absolutely need to give people some way of understanding what machine learning might be capable of so that they can make interesting choices about using it the right way or using it the wrong way. Um, wrong way is also good often. Um, but it's also about saying, hey, there are these differences between creative practice and more conventional applications, like the fact that you know, if you're Doing conventional machine learning, overfitting is something you want to avoid, and you want to learn really early not to do that. In creative applications, that can often be a really fruitful thing. So um, the way that we talk about it might be a little bit different. Um, it's not showing up too well on this. Oh. Anyway, this is, a, this is a photo of the Google Teachable Machine website. Um, if you haven't seen this, check it out. Um, Basically, Google's got a bunch of new initiatives around machine learning education and, um, and sort of getting more people, um, not necessarily interested, but getting more people to understand what machine learning is. And they called me up about a year ago, and they were like, hey, we really like Wackinator. We'd like to do something similar to that, um, but put it online. And so they made this thing that you can use just with your webcam without downloading anything, and you can train a classifier to sort of um, trigger internet um, GIFs. Um, and so I think you know, this, to me, also suggests that these approaches, these creative approaches to machine learning might be really useful in thinking about how we can educate the broader public, not just because they're fun, um, but because, for instance, this kind of approach where you're creating examples training something, changing the examples, and seeing how it changes. They really foreground how changes to the data impact what's learned. right? And if you've been paying attention to the conversation about algorithmic bias lately, for instance, that's a big part of it, this idea that you know, 
Real world machine learning also isn't about just inheriting this ground truth data set and then learning something on it. Somebody had to choose that data. That data came from somewhere. That data has implications for how that model gets built and what it's going to do. All right, so um, on this slide, I'm going to just end. This is a recap of the main um, reasons that I think machine learning is really important and useful for music and other creative fields. And um, that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to answer questions. So thank you. Before we take questions, I would make a quick announcement that this is the first one of three events that Rebecca actually is kindly <laughs> doing here this week. Uh, so obviously, there's a lot of technical stuff behind here, but also I think this is such a refreshing articulation of values mm. in designing tools with hardcore technology. Um, and I think there's so much, so many pieces to this. So the next event actually is in computer science on Friday as part of the HCI seminar. And that's going to take place at 12.30 uh, p.m. in the Gates Building, room B01. And that's going to be, it sounds like similar ideas, but really put through kind of the human computer interaction lens. And you're going to mm -hmm. go through more in detail some of the algorithms. That A little bit, yeah. yeah. And then on, on Saturday, uh, Rebecca's doing here at Karma, a half-day workshop on the title is Building New Musical Instruments with Machine Learning. And that's from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Yeah, and the idea is really um, we're going to be using Wekinator and whatever sensors people want to use. So we've got a few game tracks and, and leap motions and probably other stuff lying around here. But um, building stuff with cameras or microphones or yeah, whatever you want, controlling sound in Chuck or Max or PD or whatever you want. Um, and I'll show you how to use it, and we'll make some cool sounds. And uh, you don't have to sign up for that, but it'd be great if you, if you would, so we know how many people expect. And if you're here, probably because of the email that you got, there's a link in that. But also, please feel free to talk to uh, either one of us, and we can give you the link to sign up. Uh, so with that, maybe let's back to questions for Rebecca. Yeah. No, thank you for the talk. It's fascinating. Thanks. Um, I'm curious. So it seems that most of the musical production, the sound is kind of through a machine. Have you looked at producing more acoustic sounds, um, either through actuators or? Yeah, I I have not. So I'm trying to think. There may have been. There may have been some projects where people were doing that, but I, yeah. None comes, none come to mind. But it would, it would be really easy to do, right? Because it's just, it's sending OSC out. You can use that OSC to drive as many actuators as you want. Yeah, someone should start making stuff. Yeah. Yes. Have you uh, yet taken a look at like whether the use of like a Wagoneer type tool, um, like whether you can measure the uh, growth in like creative confidence in? Yeah, I haven't looked at that. Um, my my intuition from some of the workshops that I've run with kids is that, you know, if you can if you can teach people how to use Wekinator, and with kids, you know, doing something really simple takes about forty five minutes, and then they're pretty good with it, right? Then it's a good enough platform to say, yeah, you can build your own thing, you can customize this thing, you can personalize this thing. And then we can actually have a fairly sophisticated conversation about like what makes a fun instrument to play. Um, so I, I do think it's a good platform. And again, as I said, it's certainly more feasible than teaching them how to code first, even though I'm totally in favor of teaching people how to code as well. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't formally studied it. No. Um, actually, I do want to mention something that I didn't put in this talk is um, there's an art collective in LA called Artificial Knowing, who I just found out about a few months ago, who've been using Wekinator not with kids, but with um, local community groups, especially women of color, and um, getting them to build their own things with machine learning, not as a machine learning outreach kind of thing, not, not, not to get them to you know, become part of the computer music community or something, but actually as a way to teach people about machine learning and get them more confident in joining the conversation about how they want machine learning to be used in society. Um, and then there's another, um, another couple of folks in the UK who are thinking about, we've been applying for some money to actually 
um, get people building art projects that sort of speak back to this. So again, engaging people not just in, hey, let's build some musical instruments, but like let's get people feeling like they're capable of being part of this conversation and actually contributing to it, because we need, we need more people in that conversation. Um, yeah. Yeah, the examples you gave are mostly like two-tiered. There's a kind of single parameter, a mm -hmm. bunch of single parameter sensors, mm -hmm. and then a synthesizer. And yeah. It's kind of like the analog synth of having control voltages yeah. and the sound generators. And I wonder, like, what, how, how far a stretch is it for Wekadator to deal with audio as the training set initially? So um, the, the problem with, are you, are you talking about audio as the output or audio as the input? Audio as the input and the output. Okay, so yeah, I mean. Like the, regular 44 point. Yeah. The, um, there are a couple challenges there. The, so certainly I've used Wekinator and other people have used it where audio is the input, but you've, you've got to do feature extraction. Um, so you're taking MFCCs or you're doing some kind of you know, filter band analysis or, or whatever is the right thing for your problem. Um, if you start putting audio in, the type of, you know, if you're looking at raw audio samples, the type of algorithm that you need and the amount of data that you need and the granularity of labeling that you need just kind of make it infeasible. Like you're not going to get really good stuff out. Um, most of the algorithms that do really well with audio um, tend to require larger data sets and their training time tends to be long enough that this kind of interactive, I'm going to try this thing, train it, try that thing, um, it, it gets, you know, once you, once you take more than a minute or two to do the training, it gets really, it, it feels very different. So that's, you know, that's the, the short answer about why I'm not doing, you know, raw audio in and, and similarly for raw audio out, yeah, I think you'd need you'd need different types of of models in there. Which isn't to say that you couldn't nest that, right? I think there's certain things that Wekinator does really well where if you're getting higher level data in or you're sending higher level control parameters out, um, you can do something interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, can you tell a little bit about the, the architecture you're using for the control stuff? The training in like time series, so it's a recording? Yeah, so in these examples, I was showing you the absolute simplest thing you could do, which is basically you've got your feature extractor, the thing that's getting sensor data, that's choosing how often to send data out, and that's also choosing whether to send data, say, in frames or just, you know, single hey, here's what my data is at this instant. And in those demos, it was, hey, here's what my data is at this instant. And then I'm using the sort of simplest possible learning algorithms that don't take any sort of time um, temporal pattern into account. So every time they get an OSC message, they're making a decision about what values to output, and then they're outputting those values. Um, so you don't have to do that. There's a couple ways that you can do something more complicated. One is that you can use um, dynamic time warping, which will be good if you want to, you know, if you want to recognize, am I doing this kind of gesture or this kind of gesture? You can train it to recognize time series patterns. Or you can put that in the feature extractor to say, well, I want to take buffers uh, of examples, or I want to do some statistics on, you know, the, the mean or standard deviation or whatever. And so that also, um, ends up being really useful for some kinds of problems. You can also nest Wekinators together and do more complicated stuff that way. But yeah, it's, you know, honestly, when I, when I started doing this work, I thought I was going to be doing a lot more of that. I thought I was going to be going down the road of saying, well, we need more, um, you know, we need to do HMMs. We need to do, you know, algorithms perhaps that take into account the fact that we know that there's the stuff coming in is human gesture. Um, and I ended up not doing that, in part because hopefully, as you saw with the, the blowtard demo, actually when you're doing this instantaneous, this position goes to that sound, this position goes to that sound, you, you get, uh, you're still going to make physical gestures, but you're going to kind of explore what those physical gestures might look like, and you're going to develop a gestural vocabulary that matches the sonic gesture vocabulary that 
you find interesting. So it's really a process of saying, well, here's a mapping from this controller to sound. Let me see what I can do with it and develop those gestures. And I find that much more interesting and musically interesting um, than to say, well, I'm going to draw a circle. And a circle means play that sound. Uh, yes, I think you're first. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering about the interpolation between the different states mm -hmm. and kind of how do you develop uh, these and, and uh, how can you apply also, I don't know, machine learning to, to that? Because what, what, are, what are the interpolations that you're using right now, for example, and, and what, have you decided on them? What, when you say interpolation, well, we, you, know, the, the, you have the different position and yeah. this type, when I'm here, this is yeah. the kind of sound, yeah. when I'm here, this is the kind of sound. Yeah. Of course, as you move, there's an yeah. so, options, right. which is the exploration area. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, there, there are different options how to do those yeah. interpolations. So in this example, I was using neural networks. And it's a pretty simple, shallow neural net with one hidden layer, which gives you some complexity, right? It's not going to enforce, oh, yeah, there has to be a linear relationship in the features. Um, but it's also it tends to be pretty, you know, easily learnable with few numbers of examples, right? So that's the kind of the trade off that I was going for. And so for something, for an input like this, um, you're going to get pretty good, you know, you're going to feel like it's listening to you, it's doing what you want in different places. And you know, with neural networks, you're always going to get smooth changes as your inputs move smoothly. So it's a nice space to be working in. It starts to break down a bit if you have really, really small data sets, um, in which case changing the algorithm to either be an even simpler neural network or linear or polynomial regression is possible in the interface. And you can do that, and you'll get better results. Or if you had, say, that 10 by 10 grid, which is 100 dimensions, not giant for today's deep learning systems, but for this kind of neural net tends to give you a noticeable, noticeably slower training time. Um, sometimes that's fine, but again, sometimes it really disrupts the interactive process. But without so. changing the algorithm to follow yeah. up on this, I mean, yeah. is the idea to just, if you don't like the interpolation scheme, yeah. would you, is the, is the idea to provide like more data, kind of how to exactly. put another data point between yeah. two states and then that kind of yeah, in practice, that's yeah, like 95% of the time, that's mm -hmm. the most reasonable thing to do from a computational standpoint. And it's the thing that people naturally end up doing with this interface is to say, well, I went from here to here, and I don't like what it does in the middle, so I'll put a different sound um, in the middle. And that's, that's pretty easy to do. So the yeah. learning isn't just happening like at all at once. It's happening, well, let to say, iteratively. Right, right. Because what's happening, you know, in Wekinator, it's model the data set. It's, it's pretty dumb, right? It's called machine learning, but it's really, really dumb, right? I give it some examples, and then when I train, it builds a model from those examples. And when I go back and add examples, it just adds those to the set and retrains on the whole thing. And you can, you know, because it's simple, you can have fun with it, and you can do all sorts of weird things, like you could have it start forgetting past examples, and you have a, an interface that might actually change over time. Or you could train, um, you know, you could uh, modify certain sound parameters while keeping the mapping for other ones the same. You can do all sorts of complicated stuff if you want. Um, but that complicated stuff isn't changing the guts of the algorithm. It's changing, you know, how the models, how your set of models is trained over time and what they're doing in relation to each other and so on. Yeah. I was just curious, since Wekinator seems like such a general and delightful tool for like rapid um, iteration of some machine learning model, are there um, examples of it being used outside the domain of artistic creation? That's a good question. Um, I feel like I'd have a better answer for this if I weren't super jet lagged and thinking it were like two in the morning right now. Um, yeah, I want to say I want to say yes, but um, I don't remember. Well, the disabilities work. I guess, yeah. <clears throat> also, I see it'd be, be a nice user interface. I mean, I'd like for my camera to be watching me, and if I grimace, you know, it could like just kill that window. Yeah, open. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> there is there is some. There's some cool um, uh, facial recognition, fac facial expression recognition stuff that um, I'll show you a little video here. This guy made a, f it, his camera watches him and he trained it to recognize his emotion and uh, translate it to internet memes. 
<laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So you could, you could definitely do that. That would be really easy. I'd also like to find a way to have it tell me that my uh, right hand is drifting too far to the right of my keyboard. Oh, yeah. So I'd have to get a substitution cipher for all my type in. Yeah, you, you could do that. Yeah, you could do that. I have a little tape that says, you know, move left. Yeah. I've always wanted to make a thing that I run like when I'm about 50% of the way through marking at the end of the term where it just starts assigning grades based on how many times I growl and then how, <laughs> how hard I'm hitting my keyboard. <laughs> it would, score. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, also, is there yeah. a rule of thumb for you know, how many states in, in your one layer neural net um, as a function of how many channels of input, like if it's a 10 by 10? Yeah, so, um, so right now, first of all, it doesn't know about pixels, it could be a lot smarter. If you, if you said, well, I really want to do something that I know is going to be for images, the first thing I would say is, yeah, um, you probably want to take, take that into account and do, you know, take advantage of the fact that it's a matrix and not a vector, because right now it just takes flattened vectors of input. But the, um, the question about the, the neural net by default, um, there's a lot of like default settings in here that we're just kind of you know, we played with them until we found something that seemed to work for most people. Um, by default, the number of hidden layers is going to be equal to the number of inputs. Um, so it's, it is, the complexity is going to scale as your number of inputs grows. Um, you can change that. You can change it to whatever number you want. Um, most people don't. In general, do you want to use as much as you have time for? In other words, you know, let's say you know, you're comfortable waiting five seconds. Yeah. Do you want to just really use that up, or, or is there more of a right-sized answer? Well, so for a lot of the things that people are doing, um, it isn't actually, you know, having more time doesn't necessarily give you better results. Like, often, the types of things that people are trying to teach it are quite learnable. Right? So they're not actually complex concepts that require a huge network um, and require lots of training data. So I think it's, like, it's really important that you know, you, not just that it's able to learn quickly, but um, that you don't need to be turned into you know, the, the robotic person who's saying, I'm going to you know, generate a thousand more training examples. Um, so that's, that's actually, um, yeah, that's pretty. Important, but again, you know, the, there's that's the general answer. But people do weird stuff with this, where probably they run into the limits of that, and it breaks, and they don't know why. And that's also part of why I, I am teaching this course online to say, well, you know, you can you can do the kinds of demos that I just showed you. You can learn how to do that in half an hour. Um, as soon as it doesn't do what you expect it to do, having a little bit more knowledge about what's happening is really valuable. Um, and that knowledge is not the same knowledge that you would get from a you know, machine learning class in a computer science course. Like Some of that is useful, but a lot of it still doesn't, doesn't give you the intuition about how to change. Do I change the data? Do I change the neural net? Do I scrap this and give up and do a different thing? Do I change my feature extractor? Um, and of course, part of what I always teach my students is that you know even people with PhDs in machine learning often don't know the answers, and it's just it's about experimentation, and they're they're horrified. They're like, how could you, how could you live like that? Like, well, <laughs> you know, you just you keep trying. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I'm guessing you're not doing testing. So testing. How, how, testing inside the training stage. Define testing. I guess where you just try it out instead, right? But how do you handle overfitting or underfitting? Yeah, so there's, yeah, this is, it's good to talk about this. So um, if you have done any kind of conventional machine learning, right, rule number one is you don't want to overfit. You don't want to trust your training examples so much that you're unable to make accurate predictions in the future because you probably have some noise in your training examples, right? So the way that you would normally test for that is some kind of either taking held out data and testing on that, or you would simulate held out data and do something like cross-validation. You get a score of how well your model is going to generalize. Wecknitter allows you to do that. And you can do that. And sometimes that is actually a really good idea, right? So um, I want 
it, for instance, um, if I'm getting Wekinator to recognize I've got a dancer doing particular movements and I want to make sure that you know it's recognizing those, I probably want to um, compare a few different algorithms and say, well, should I be using an SVM or add a boost or whatever on this? And I can really quickly compare things in an objective way by running that kind of test. Um, however, there's some problems with that. Um, number one, if I've got features that actually aren't that noisy, like the game track, for instance, um, if I'm using an algorithm that really doesn't want to overfit, it's highly regularized, it's not that trusting of my data, often what happens is that I give it an example and say, no, I want you to do this thing over here. And it ignores that. And it feels like the system's not listening to me, and it's really frustrating. So under certain circumstances, you actually really want the algorithm to overfit. Um, and again, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more formally on Friday. Um, that's part of what makes this work really well, the fact that if you don't have much noise, you as a person are really smart. You're able to say, hey, I'm going to find that spot where it's making a mistake, and I'm going to give it examples in that spot. Right? So if you know about active learning algorithms, active learning, you know, they're going to find the examples that would be really helpful to get labels for. You're kind of doing the opposite piece of that as a human to say, oh, here's something where it's making a mistake. I'm going to correct that. And if you have something like nearest neighbor that's really happy to overfit, you're actually going to learn the proper concept much faster with fewer examples and fewer iterations. So um, sometimes, and again, this is some of, one of the things that I talk about a lot in my class with my students, overfitting can be exactly, exactly the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so you might want to <laughs> you know, keep that in mind. One question on yeah. this get started, I think it's a big question. Yeah. I just want to chip away at this. Yeah. And it's kind of this idea that I think in a, in a world where we tend to think of machine learning and maybe it's almost a metaphor for technology in general, it's mm. kind of like means to an end. The big button, right? Yeah. Button. We press it, we get a result, right? And whereas I think what I'm getting from here is kind of this importance of the things in the middle of getting to that. And that actually as something that fundamentally matters and yeah. that is worth considering. Interactive machine learning has been around, and I, I would say you're among, you probably first applied to HCI and music kind of in yeah. one fell swoop. And clearly, as Dylan's question, you, you are interested in this beyond music. Here's the question. So it feels to me like there's this, like people think of technology, machine learning, deep learning is this, like we can't help but think of it as this red button. It's easy yeah. to think of it that way. And I think you're trying to get us to see something else. How do we, you know, I don't know if it's an education question, <laughs> I don't know if it's like, I don't know, like, a, I'm not even sure what kind of question it yeah. is. How do we bridge that so people, yeah, you know, yeah. smart people here can get that just like, I think more, I would call it more of this human, in the mm -hmm. group, human dimension. Mm -hmm. This is a big question. But yeah, it is a big question. This was pretty closely related to the subject of my NIPS keynote, where I talked, to, I tried to talk to a room of machine learning researchers who are focused on very different, like super interesting, but very different problems, to get them to try to contextualize the work that they're doing in a human context. And said, hey, you know, let's talk about this. For instance, let's talk about the design process and how machine learning. You know, you are actually engaged in this process as a machine learning researcher, whether you know it or not. People using machine learning to do something, to make something, are engaged in this process. How are you supporting them at each stage? What is machine learning doing for them? What are the challenges that they're likely to face because they need to be doing, they need to be thinking in a particular way or acting in a particular way um, at different, you know, different stages of a creation process, no matter what domain they're in. And so just, you know, trying to, you know, I think there, there is a lot of room for education of machine learning researchers, not necessarily because you know, I, I, I don't want to be too hard on them. They're doing really cool stuff, and we're, we're seeing some really useful technologies coming out of it. But often, you know, the way that you publish work in machine learning research is very much, hey, I have an algorithm that gives better results according to this metric or runs faster um, for this type of problem. And, it's very hard to kind of question, is that the right metric? When is that the right metric? When is that the wrong metric? Um, you know, how does somebody actually put this into practice? Um, so there's, yeah, there's lots of interesting questions. They're certainly not just in the creative domain. Well, I, I, I think 
hearing you say this and after this talk, it does make me realize that you know music doesn't seem to be. It's not you're not doing. In a way, music is kind of like almost the perfect vehicle yeah. to do this because yeah. it's like it's it's something that's clearly not. Well, most of the time, it's not a problem to be solved, even though we solve a lot of problems to mm -hmm. get to the music, right? But the music in itself is, is music, and it's, a, it's an experience, it's a process. Um, and maybe, I think Dylan's question of how did this broaden and generalize to non-musical non or non-artistic, non-creative yeah. contexts, maybe there's something fundamental in music, in the fact that you are applying this to music. Because I think that's that applied to disability, for example, like applied to. So I, I don't. I mean, this is more turning a more of a comment. Yeah. I think yeah. there's music seems more than because you happen to be a computer music researcher. Yeah. Research. No, I, I do. I do think there's something special about music, and I talk to people in the HCI community about this a lot. And I part of it is just the diversity of problems that we think about in music, right? Um, in the, the set of musical applications that I've looked at, some of them, like I mentioned, you know, cello bow gesture recognition, that looks a lot like a traditional computer science machine learning problem in that you know, you, you're trying to create accurate predictions of something that's actually kind of hard to, you know, to label otherwise. And machine learning gives you a good tool for that, and you can build big data sets, and you can try to generalize to new people, and so on. Um, so that all the way to you know, Michelle Nagai making her piece of tree bark into an instrument, and you have people doing audio. And you know, audio is a really challenging domain to make sense of. And again, trying to do semantic classification of audio all the way to let's make like a crazy you know, musical instrument kind of thing. Um, so there's, there's a broad set of applications that people are interested in, broad set of reasons for using machine learning. Um, and people who, I mean, I love working with musicians because often um, you, know, you have people who are really, you know, they may not be coming from technical backgrounds. Um, and so you need to make usable tools, but they're also often really uncompromising, right? But they're experimental. And I think I've, I've been really lucky to work with people who are like, yeah, hey, there's a new thing. I'm going to figure out what I can do with it. I'm not going to be um, scared off by um, the fact that it's technology, but I'm not also not going to be you know, buying into the hype of what's cool and what's not. Actually, when, when I started working on Wekinator in 2008, I didn't tell computer scientists that it was using neural networks, because that was a dirty word. And I didn't tell the composers that it was neural networks, because I didn't want anybody to like, make fun of them, because neural, neural networks are not cool at all. But they were the right tool for doing this kind of stuff, for the reasons you know, that I was telling you. And, Composers were like, yeah, whatever. We don't care. We just want it to work, and you know, they're willing to be experimental and again find out what something's good for. But if it's not good for them, if it doesn't actually give them value, they're not going to use it. They don't have time for that. I'm not paying them to <laughs> to do it, and they certainly have other things that they can do instead. So yeah, I, I think I'm, I've benefited a lot from working in that really rich environment. Yeah. I, I think one really. Uh Thing, but one thing that really jumped out at me was that you know I, I've seen a lot of machine learning go around, you know, roll out papers and stuff. But uh, your work was the first thing I ran into that was doing it in real time now. So yeah, I, I mean that was just a real reset for me. That wait a minute, I can do this now. Yeah, I have to run a GPU for three days. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. And I, you know, I. There's something, there is a step change in how people think about it and what people are able to do with it when you get the time down. Yeah. And, you know, I, deep learning, the, the sort of state of the art methods now, they are going to become faster and it's going to be easier and easier to do real time stuff with them. Um, and, and, you know, even right now, some of the stuff I've done, you know, you can you can roughly run some deep learning methods in real time and do some cool stuff if you stick Wackinator on top. Um, but you know, that's coming. But I, I definitely, another reason that I'm using a you know, one layer neural net in here is you know, that, was, that used to take days to train decades ago. And we just were reaping the benefits of faster computers. But it's totally changed. You know, if you look at, obviously, like I'm not the first person to use neural nets in music. You know, David Wessel was doing this in 1990 or something. Um, but it's, 
it's a different way of building things. It's a different interaction when you can say, well, what if I do this with the data set? All right, what if I do that with the data set? And you're, you're not going and having a coffee in the middle. So I see a lot of classification-based stuff. Do you also do sequence modeling type stuff? Um, not really. And again, you know, dynamic time warping, you know, it depends on what you mean by sequence modeling. That's going to, more or less, it's going to give you a model of a sequence or a few sequences and then figure out which one you're in. Um, I've wanted for a while to integrate um, IRCAM's gesture follower and Baptiste Cremio's gesture variation follower into this. The reason I haven't is just time. But I think you know where you get information, for instance, in those systems, you're getting information how far through the gesture sequence are you? Are you performing the sequence faster or larger or other types of um, you know vary with other types of variation? So I think you know there's a lot to explore there. Um, yeah. The challenge is, and, and you know, this is one of the nice things about the gesture follower paper, if you guys know it, is you know, a lot of the off-the-shelf sequence modeling um, techniques require a fair amount of data. And when you only get one example per sequence, it gets really tiring as a person to do, <laughs> to do many. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I find it really fascinating pointing to the time aspect of things because, of course, one of, I think one of the most uh, rich things in, in music and fascinating is that uh, anytime you're listening uh, to any, anything in music, it actually has multiple duration at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. There's that moment of whatever it has the timbre, it's yeah. part of uh, maybe a motif that you can consider as yeah. two notes, but it's yeah. actually part of the phrase and yeah. it's very often part of the whole section. And what is it that we're listening to and training and so yeah. on? So, so, so this whole idea of, of then creating maps, what are you mapping? I think there are amazing complexities. And, yeah. and so lots to work on. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so, so it's, it's a very exciting area. And of course, it will be really interesting. And the, then there's the limit of real time. Because of course, how, how yeah. can you listen to you don't even know what duration. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but you, it, it's just wonderful that you're interested. But I have to say that I'm, I'm really excited to see you uh, open my mind, but open all of our minds, I guess, to, to uh, the embracing of the surprise of okay. the error and, and the kind of interesting relationship of trust that you try to build between us and the machine in some ways. It's yeah. this kind of strange companion that, that, uh, uh, that accepts our errors and we enjoy their errors. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I think that this is, this is what makes it really into kind of a exciting collaborative uh, tool. Yeah, and I definitely, I mean, it's, again, I love coding, I, I love programming, but so often when you have an error and you're programming, it's like, hey, compiler error. Like, you're not, that's not a happy surprise. That's not serendipitous. You don't <laughs> get value from that, <laughs> right? And, you know, when you're working with examples, you're, you're in a space where, like, no matter what happens, you're going to get something out. I think even that, even if it doesn't do what you want, often it's, you're just, it's a, it's a state change from programming. Thank you very much. Yeah.